Remember those events that brought us these fifteen years of shame. But remember also those who fell to restore the glorious Star League. Above all, remember the blood legacy of Aiden Pride, child of Kerensky. He made the final sacrifice so that his clan could continue. For eternity shall we praise him. In fifteen years shall we avenge him. The Remembrance, Passage 417, verse 29, Lines 74 through 79. Swift, well-equipped, resilient, and powerful, the Lanner Falcon from the days of ancient Terra earned its reputation as a cunning bird of prey. While not as powerful as larger predators, it had evolved powerful talons with which it gripped its prey while a notch on its beak called the Tomiel Tooth allowed the Lanner Falcon to quickly make the kill. It was a blend of form and function that helped it excel across the biomes of the Middle East, Africa, and Mediterranean. A thousand years later, the descendants of the Lanner Falcon still fly over many Jade Falcon worlds. Often, the bird is seen working together with the smaller fire falcon to take down larger prey. This is something the designers had in mind when they were designing new mechs for Clan Jade Falcon. On the battlefields of Clan Space and the Inner Sphere, the Black Lanner carries on the legacy of quick and efficient use of force of its namesake. As far as Clan Mechs go, the 55-ton Black Lanner was a technically a late comer to the Clan Invasion. Though it was first seen during the contentious and disappointing Clan Jade Falcon trials on Tukid, those mechs were comparatively brand new in comparison to most of the other clan mechs brought into the trial. In fact, those Black Lanners returned with the Falcon Cons from the production lines on Stranamecti just before the battle. Envisioned as speedy fire support units within stars of light and medium mechs, the Black Lanner quickly proved it was more than capable in that mission. The A, B, C, and D variants were identified by Comstar Intelligence Gathering on Tukid, and all but the D configuration focused mainly on longer range fire with either energy weapons or LRMs. Built around a 385XL JF engine and the core of JF5 Endo Steel, the Black Lanner easily outpaces almost all other medium, heavy, and assault mechs on the battlefield. With a top speed of 119 km per hour and 151 with the integrated mask enabled, Many Inner Sphere mech warriors and light mechs were astonished to see the 55-ton mech chase them down. Also employing compound ferrofibrous armor and double heat sinks, the Black Lanner has all the bells and whistles one would expect from a clan mech produced in the 3050s, especially for configurations that take advantage of ECM and active probes. As far as armament goes, the 13 tons of pod space doesn't seem like a lot considering the Storm Crow, also a 55-ton design, has 23 tons of pod space. For better or worse, the cost of creating a mech that is so impressively fast must be paid for somewhere. The primary configuration fits the theme of many Omni mechs, which is a generalist multi-use setup. The right arm sports an ER large laser that is backed up in both long and short range by an LRM-10, SRM-6, and two ER medium lasers. The addition of an ECM suite rounds out what is an entirely serviceable loadout. While it is fun to talk about specialized mechs that really excel in short, long, or confined combat situations, there's something to be said for a mech that can just consistently perform no matter where it ends up fighting. That's the Black Lanner Prime. Almost all the Black Lanners produced ended up in the hands of the Jade Falcons, who jealously coveted the design. Often the Black Lanner was teamed up with lighter mechs like the Fire Falcon, Koshi, and Fire Moth. The lighter mechs could serve as scouts and bait for larger mechs, which would then find themselves surrounded and pulled apart by the Black Lanner's heavier weapons. It's a symbiotic relationship too much like the behavior we've seen between the Lanner Falcons and the Fire Falcons to have been a coincidence. Now we really understand the value of giving a mech a good name, right? Eventually, through trials in Asorla, some Black Lanners did end up in the hands of Clan Steel Viper and Clan Ice Hellion, but please don't hold that against it. During the Higira War in 3061, the Steel Vipers launched a campaign into Jade Falcon occupation space in the Inner Sphere. In those early months of successes, the Vipers collected significant numbers of Falcon mechs and vehicles. A second wave of strikes was similarly successful, but eventually Martha Pride turned the tables with her own flanking drive through Clan Steel Viper territory. 
Seeing the inevitable defeat, Clan Steel Viper left their gains. On November 5th, 3069, in the middle of the yearly celebration of Alexander Kerensky and Exodus Day, the Steel Vipers, who had never been big fans of the Jade Falcons, decided to make their move to completely undermine their rival and boot them from Clan space. In Trials, the Jade Falcons had begun to use artillery effectively along with other tactics learned from fighting against Inner Sphere forces. Now turning those methods against the Steel Vipers, the Khan and Sakan of Steel Viper were appalled, or they feigned it well in their attempt to seize upon the perceived weakness. During a Grand Council meeting, Sakan Nicole Hoskins said, What has addled your mind that you would remark upon their battlefield utility, with battles against the spheroids as evidence of said utility? Why is the barbarism of their methods no longer an example of what to avoid, and instead an example of what to emulate? When have such tactics become something to admire? Khan Ariel Suvorov of the Goliath Scorpions countered by stating, Sakan, it is a foolish warrior who fails to adapt to their enemy. Sakan Hoskins responded, Foolish? Is it foolish to select a course based on honor instead of utility? Why do we then shun orbital bombardment and nuclear weaponry? Why have battle mechs at all? Would you us rather do battles by proxy, sending mindless robots to do every bidding? Is that what we must become? No, I refuse to accept that. I aspire to something greater. The Steel Viper Clan aspires to the true way of the clans, the true intent of the founder when he made the clans, not this slow perversion back to the very ways that sundered the Star League and fueled the Pentagon Civil War. That went over about as well as you would expect, with the Steel Vipers eventually demanding a censure vote against Clan Jade Falcon. That vote would fail, but the Steel Vipers launched a series of attacks across Jade Falcon holdings in the Clan homeworlds. By January of 3070, every Falcon enclave had been hit. Large amounts of Asorla, supplies, machinery, and battle mechs, such as the Black Lantern, fell into Viper hands. Turning their attention toward the Snow Ravens, a Black Lantern mech warrior by the name of Michael Mercer rose to prominence. His skill in the mech, in fighting on the Snow Raven capital of Loam, earned him the right to join his Khan as he left the system. Unfortunately for Mercer, that dropship they shared was targeted by a Raven warship named the Avalanche, and it was destroyed. Maybe the mech survived? Hope springs eternal. Losing the original production facility on Strata Mechti and eventually Ironhold meant that the Black Lantern would forever remain a very rare sight even among the Jade Falcons who so revered it. Later in the timeline, a production line was set up on Sudeten, but it also ends up receiving significant damage during the Word of Blake kerfuffle. During the Dark Age years, Olivetti weaponry on that repaired Sudeten production line did start producing new Black Lanterns, though in limited numbers. In the battle within the Rydsen River Valley, Black Lantern T configurations built around a plasma cannon in the right arm were instrumental in cleaving many 17th Arcturian Guard mech warriors from the mortal coil. Even though they were outweighed by their opponents, the Lyran battle mechs were severely limited by the spikes and heat generated by those plasma cannons. Shutting down or on the edge of a shutdown, the Lyrans were cut down by swarming Jade Falcon light mechs. Once again, the Black Lantern showed it was valuable when a star consisting of two of them, along with two Fire Falcons, were sent to hunt down a fleeing Lyran lance suspected of carrying valuable intelligence data. Sure enough, using tried and true tactics, the star was able to catch up to the lance and prevent its escape through fire and fury. At the dawn of the Ill Clan era, the future of the Black Lantern is in doubt, following a near complete destruction of Clan Jade Falcon under the murderous tutelage of Malvina Hazen. If the clan does end up seeing a revival in the coming years and decades, I hope that the Black Lantern is on that short list to see a future production. If not, perhaps the Ravens or Bears can pick up the ball and run with it. As far as the homeworld clans go, the Black Lantern is no longer produced locally. The first four variants and the primary configuration are what pushed the Black Lantern to be such a beloved medium Omnimech among the Jade Falcons and what made it feared by their foes. Let's take a look at each and see what they have to offer. The Black Lantern A is an electronic warfare fan's delight. Built around an ERPPC in the right arm, the only other weapons are a pair of medium pulse lasers in the left arm. The rest of the pod space is dedicated to an active probe, an ECM suite, and a tag system. This allows the A configuration to play a support rule on the battlefield while still being able to put fire on a target at distance. The two medium pulse lasers can't be ignored either in a situation when it closes on a target. 
The Black Lantern B is a long-range fire support build that pairs a couple of LRM-20s and puts them to good use. That's an impressive number of missiles on a 55 tonner. However, there is only enough ammo for nine shots with both launchers, so make sure those shots count. Additionally, the mech lacks any secondary weapon system, so you're going to need to make sure it doesn't get hunted down early on in the fight. The Black Lantern C is a good mid-range brawler that relies on a bank of six ER medium lasers in the left arm and a streak SRM-6 in the right. That's an impressive amount of firepower, but even with the addition of three more double heat sinks, the C configuration is a toasty boy. An Alpha Strike while standing will put the C at eight heat, which is manageable every once in a while, but you're going to pay for it with the next turn. Make those shots count. The Black Lantern D configuration is a short-range brawler that will eat small mechs, like a mini mech frog eats tomatoes out of a garden. You turn your back for 10 seconds and the whole place is picked clean. The D has two medium pulse lasers, two ER small lasers, two SRM-6s, four machine guns, a flamer, and an active probe. If the Black Lantern D is able to catch up with a target, which it usually can thanks to that big engine, it's going to be putting a lot of fire on a target. Even if most of it ends up missing, you only need those few shots to land before a light mech you're targeting is going to be hurting. This is one of the deadliest versions of the Black Lantern, and you definitely shouldn't underestimate it. For the rest of these configurations, there is a time jump to at least 3061, so keep that in mind if you're playing a game set in the Clan Invasion era. The Black Lantern E is a 3061 variant equipped with three ER medium lasers and an ATM-12. For those rusty on the new weaponry, the ATM stands for Advanced Tactical Missile. The launcher can fire a variety of missile types at different ranges depending on the need of the user and the ammo stocked. The E-Config is a good general use setup, but the battle value creeps up to almost 1800. At that cost, there may be better mechs out there if you're looking out to fill a star. The Black Lantern H is a 3061 variant armed with a heavy large laser and two medium pulse lasers. There are four additional double heat sinks with an ECM suite as well. If you're really into heavy large lasers, that H could be the configuration for you. I'm personally not a big fan of the heavy lasers, so to each his or her own. The Black Lantern F is built around five medium pulse lasers in the right arm, six light machine guns in the left arm in two arrays, and the light active probe. It's a solid scout mech and can tear up light mechs. However, the battle value of 2,154 makes it a big investment. High risk, high reward for this configuration. The Black Lantern T carries a plasma cannon in the right arm, an SRM-6, LRM-10, and two improved heavy medium lasers. It has always struck me as an updated version of the primary configuration, which is a generalist that can work well in most ranges. The use of the plasma cannon is interesting as it can really hobble an energy weapon heavy target. It's a great weapon for a mech that's relying upon swarming tactics with allies. That battle value of the T is just over 2000, which makes it a somewhat pricey addition to your force. The Black Lantern G is described as a missile boat. However, I think it's much more accurate to say that it's a long range fire support design. The primary weapon is an ER large pulse laser in the right arm, which is going to be doing most of your heavy lifting. There are also four LRM-5s which can crit seek and wear down targets at any range. The G also has an extra double heat sink which will make the mech heat neutral even while running in alpha striking. It's a solid build, however a bit pricey at 1929 battle value. The Black Lantern I is a bit of an odd duck as it carries an inner sphere technology medium variable speed pulse laser as its primary weapon. Backed up with three heavy machine guns, a streak SRM-4, two ER medium lasers, and a targeting computer, the eye is advertised as a skirmisher. I think it's a bit of a mess. If you're really into VSP lasers, this could be attractive, but there are better configurations out there if you want to skirmish. The Black Lantern J is another interesting variant because it employs a protomech AC-8 as its primary weapon in the right arm. Though originally designed for protomechs, mechs can carry these autocannons as well. It'll do 8 damage and generate 2 heat. The range of the autocannon is quite short, so keep that in mind. To back it up, the J also has 3 ER medium lasers and a supercharger, because going fast is good, but going really, really, really fast is even better. The J configuration can hit a top speed of 194.4 km per hour, which is an eye-watering speed for a 55-ton mech. If you want to make sure that you're the fastest mech on the battlefield, the J may be the mech for you. Our last official variant is the X configuration, which makes use of a rotary AC2 autocannon in the right arm. 
it takes up almost all of the Black Lantern X's pod space. The autocannon ammo in the left torso is protected with a Case 2, which weighs a half a ton on Clan Max. It also has a Case 2 in the left arm, where there is no ammo, but there are two improved heavy medium lasers. While this might seem like a waste of a case, remember the improved heavy lasers can explode if they receive a critical hit. Each laser will cause 5 damage if destroyed, so the Case 2 reduces that damage to 1, with a chance of a critical hit. If you're a fan of either the improved heavy lasers or the rotary autocannon, this could be the variant for you. I'm not a fan of either of them, so uh, I haven't run this one on the tabletop. Now that we're done with the official variants, overall, the Black Lantern is a solid 55 ton mech if you are a fan of a stable platform which can travel as fast as most lights. If you prefer a heavier hitter, the Stormcrow or Nova might be the better alternative. I appreciate that the clans have these specialized designs to give forces some unique flavor. The Jade Falcon philosophy, even as it evolves over the decades, is well suited to the Black Lantern. Are you a believer in the power of the Black Lantern? Have you had experience running up against one on the tabletop? Do you have a favorite variant? Let me know in the comments below. Big thanks for watching, hitting all the buttons so that YouTube knows I'm worth sharing with others. Going the extra step by becoming a channel member is a very big deal as even just one membership can eclipse the paltry amount earned through AdSense. Membership includes a link to our Discord where the nonsense flows continually. Until we meet again, take care and go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.